so I am going to introduce myself. Uh, I my name is Christina Ballard. I work for Smart Reproduction, and we are a USDA approved center for the uh, collection, crowd preservation, and export of semen and embryos for small ruminants. This means that we work with top producers here in the United States, and also uh, people who want to improve their uh, genetics internationally. So uh, this is important because it gives me a bird's eye view of the entire industry. Uh, next, I also work for Delta Livestock Diagnostics, which is a serological testing laboratory. Uh, and we specialize in endemic disease testing, CAE, Yoni, CL, and early pregnancy detection in sheep and goats as well. Uh, today, we will investigate the lean farming methodology and the tools you will need to create a more efficient operation. Remember, efficacy equals profitability. And you will be using math if you adopt this strategy. Uh, don't be afraid. Embrace it. Work with it. Work, run with it. Uh, lean farming refers to the application and implementation of tools, methodologies, and practices to improve performance and efficacies in your operation. This means, um, you know, instead of using a shovel, use a tractor. And instead of warming every six weeks, use a fecal egg count or the matcha uh, technique to evaluate anemia and worm load within your animals. Um, this approach is currently used in many areas of agriculture and has a clear usefulness in small ruminant production. Uh, so this is proven. Uh, I have used it personally on the farm with vegetable production as well as livestock applications. Um, and just a, a, a moment on my background, I have a degree in plant science. I was also a jet engine mechanic and with that entire application, your thought is to start with the simplest thing first and then increase as you look for a problem with further complexity. So we're going to start dumb and end up hard. Uh, to begin to implement lean farming, producers need to decide on the type of operation. Uh, these can include seed stock, rear, commercial, homesteader, or hobbyist. Remember, um, show stock can come from any four of these production modules. And, uh, but rarely do you have a focus of just show stock. There's, there's a mix of, of one or two or all of them. Having an honest evaluation of your program's goals and capacity is the key to a profitable operation. Uh, each type of production system listed in the previous slide will have different metrics of success. Um, there's no shame in, in your game if you want to be a hobby breeder, if you want to just have a couple of goats to to hang out and enjoy, or if you want to, uh, you know, engage in the highest tier of breeding and genetic improvement. Uh, so first one will be seed stock. This is what is known as a breeder, supplying top tier registered stock to all sectors of the industry. They're typically the leader in engaging in performance data and evaluation programs that further sheep and goat breeds. Commercial. A commercial operation can consist of animals that are registered or unregistered. The defining aspect is the animals and their byproducts, meat, milk, or fiber, are raised almost exclusively for human consumption by local, regional, and national level food systems. The homesteader is an operation, uh, has an operation that focuses on food production to meet the needs of their family. The sales of animals and their byproducts do happen, though these are typically viewed as incidental when compared to feeding immediate and extended household. And then you have a hobby breeder, typically fewer than animals with the sole purpose to satisfy a love for the animals while utilizing the opportunity to graze small acreage. Rarely do hobby producers raise any other agricultural products and tend to break even or lose money on their production system. So each livestock enterprise has different resources, management, land, labor, capital, and feed available to them. And you know, all of these factors need to really be looked at and quantified. Remember, quantified, uh, it means exact, and qualified means you're, guess you're guessing. And any existing operation can benefit as well as potential endeavors. So let's say you already have a sheep or goat operation. Um, let's make sure that you're using your resources to their greatest capacity and with the most efficiency, because that's going to mean money but also time, and time has value, and we tend to undervalue that as producers. Examples of data collection programs, this is gonna be your, you know, this is a, a very important part of improving the breed, of improving genetics generationally. So we're gonna start on the goat side, since they are my favorite. 
Uh, the American Dairy Goat Association has DHIA, which is Dairy Herd Improvement, which is where you're submitting milk samples and getting component analysis along with length of lactation cycles. This was first uh, created with dairy cattle, so this has a long history and it has been proven uh, to work. Uh, and then linear appraisal, which is you are having your animals examined, you know, specific parts of the animal, animal be it, you know, rump steepness, steepness to odor attachment to teat placement. Um, and performance reports, you know, what the, the, the progeny look like, what, you know, what, how are they performing? Are they doing, are daughters doing well on milk test, which is the DHIA? Uh, uh, the developed genetic evaluations and DNA verification. You want to make sure the animals that you are breeding are actually from that sire or that dam, and it has become the norm within the dairy goat world, um, boar goats, key goats, um, all of the major registries are now requiring DNA verification as well as most countries that we export to. Another uh, data collection program is the buck test. Uh, the longest running would be the uh, Virginia buck test. There are ones in Louisiana, there's ones in Mississippi um, and Oklahoma. And the purpose are to provide producers with an unbiased evaluation of economically valuable traits in a shared and equitable environment. That means the animals that go are about the same age, about the same weight, exposed to parasites, and then they are in purposely infected with homunculus contortus, which is the barber pole worm. And then the traits are measured over that period of time, average daily gain, fecal egg count. And they've also um, started to incorporate the ultrasounding of the loin area, which is important because that is live animal carcass data, which is going to be very important when you start looking at feed uh, efficiency, which is part of the average daily gain, and then also parasite resistance. So while historically open to all breeds, the Kiko breed is known for their participation and success. So now we're going to uh, switch to the sheep side. EBVs are fairly new. Um, they're the estimated breeding values. Uh, they have uh, the first a uh, program for something like this was started in cattle, and the sheep industry saw this. There's some innovative, progressive breeders that jumped on this and said, we need it. Uh, so EBVs are science-based, industry-tested measurements of heritable traits that can be tracked and measured. This plan is managed by the National Sheep Improvement Plan, or the NSIP. Uh, these EBVs enhance on-farm productivity and breeding and help you make sound breeding decisions as they measure and track economically important traits not determined by visual appraisal alone. You know, you can look at an animal and say, you know, they're very well put together. Uh, they have, uh, you know, some very appealing traits economically, but until you can prove that they are inheritable, then it doesn't really matter. Performance data is collected on farm and adjusted for variables that are not related to genetics, such as flock management techniques. They are calculated on the performance of the individual animal, related animals in the same flock, and related animals in other flocks. So you are literally capturing the, gen the genetic generational output of these animals. Uh, they are a proven method of accurately predicting if an animal will pass on important traits such as growth rate, reproductive proficiency, carcass quality, wool quality, and parasite resistance. Um, some really good examples of that are the Katahdins with the parasite resistance and the polypay with weaning rates. And weaning rates is, you know, how many animals do those, does that maternal flock uh, bring to uh, weaning age? And as we all know, that's a very economically uh, important uh, aspect. Just wanted to make sure that I was not missing anything. I'm having problems um, with my internet. Christina, can I interrupt you a bit, please? Another uh, production uh, program is with the Dairy Sheep Association of North America. While not as well known, it has a very important um, proof of concept in Canada. And they use the, that version there for the PIP. And you can see the, the data that it collects, uh, breed, pre pedigree, date of birth, animal ID, lambing data, reproduction traits, milk yield, and the quantity that's going to be, you know, the component volume um, and somatic cell count. Why does, why does any of this information matter? This is the important part. These 
the EDVs in the performance test show the value of regular and systemic data collection. This is literally in hand proof that if you integrate any of this on farm, you will have value to it. These systems can be replicated and adjusted for any size operation or species. Data collection allows producers to identify more productive and healthier individuals. Culling less economically valuable animals results in greater productivity and fewer management issues over time. I'm just going to probably say this a couple of times throughout the entire uh, webinar. The purchase price is the least amount of money you're going to spend on an animal. If you invest in animals that have a proven genetic track record to give you, to, to introduce the traits that you desire into your herd or flock, and are healthier animals due to genetic predisposition for parasite resistance, or they have been disease tested, um, you, are, you are literally, they're going to pay for themselves over lack of through lack of management issues, you know, your time, your labor, labor invested into keeping these animals healthy. Examples of on-farm data collection that can be per performed by any size producer. Uh, birth weight. That's an easy one. 30, 60, and 90-day weights used to determine average daily gain. You will see ADG a lot. Uh, that can be calculated by taking the amount of weight an animal has gained since the last weight and dividing the weight by the number of days since that last weight. So, sounds complicated. It's very simple. Birth type, single or number of multiples in the birth. You know, this is super important. This is going to tell you who has the ability uh, generationally to, you know, double or triple your flock size through uh, birth weight birth numbers. Uh, rearing type, how many did the dam raise? It's great if a, if a you gives you triplets, but if she only can raise one, then that's something to think about. You know, is there something going on health-wise, utter structure um, that's precluding her from nursing? For example, a blind teat, a fish teat, um, or disease, or nutrition. Uh, another Data collection aspect is the FAMACHA score, eyelid scoring method for detection of anemia caused by the barber pole worm, which is exceptionally important to control here in the South. Um, we all have either fought with ourselves or we know of people who have had, you know, massive economic losses. And, you know, you're looking at the loss of the money you've invested and the future earnings that animal can have made and the fact that we don't want to lose our animals no matter what. It, it makes us sad. And uh, I'm not going to lie that I cry every time I do. Uh, fecal worm egg count. Uh, this is going to take, you know, some very inexpensive um, items from the dollar store. You know, a plastic cup, a metal strainer, uh, some Epsom salt so you can make uh, the, the fecal float uh, liquid. And then a, a microscope. A couple hundred bucks can get you something that you can use to do this. It's a quantitative examination of the manure for internal parasite eggs. And it can benefit the producer in important ways. Uh, so do you need to know if your dewormer is working? Uh, that's a huge is, uh, issue here is dewormer resistance. Um, so you would do an FEC. You would examine the manure, count your eggs, figure out uh, what kind of internal parasites you have going on, deworm that animal, and then see what the reduction in your fecal egg count is. Uh, if there is no reduction or if it's not significant, you need to think about, you know, what other class of warmers do you have that can, can fight this. Um, also, monitoring pasture contamination. Remember, this is a fecal-oral transmission route. So, you know, if you have animals that have high uh, worm loads, do you really want them just pooping it up everywhere and contaminating your pasture to infect other animals? And then if you have animals that are... Let's say they look great when you look at their eyelids. They are nice and pink, but they have a high worm load. That can denote the genetic ability to resist the worms. And honestly, that's not a bad thing to breed into your herd. Um, of course, when you breed for one thing, you lose something else. So that does have to be balanced out in the long run. Um, in your maternal flock, incidents of mastitis and ewes and does. 
Uh, you are, you know, there's nothing worse than having to fight mastitis. It is expensive. It is demoralizing. Um, and it really does impact your weaning rates on your kids and lambs. Um, genetics and management issues can contribute. So you want to make sure it's not something you're doing or it's uh, something that that animal is just precluded to. If you are milking, daily milk production, uh, so obviously if you're going to be dumping feed into an animal, you want them to produce as much as possible. Um, and also when you're as someone who has milked many a dairy goat, a, a sharp decline in milk production can indicate a health issue. And that gives you time to get a jump on that. Uh, so here is another aspect of herd management that significantly impacts profit margins. And this can be, uh, this impact can be through not just, you know, production, it can be through loss of sales. You don't want to buy somebody else's problem because it just, you're, you're behind the game, game when you start. So the three that you'll typically hear of is CAE or caprine arthritic encephalitis or OPP, which is ovine progressive pneumonia. So that is the same virus. It's a small lentivirus and it expresses itself a little differently from species to species. Uh, it is species specific. So if you have, uh, let's say cattle, they're not going to catch CAE uh, typically. And then yonis, uh, that is a disease of concern. It is endemic here in the United States. Um, that is a fecal oral transmission route. And then CL, which is you know commonly known as the uh, abscess disease. Uh, starting with and maintaining a disease-free flock means fewer issues to manage and time is money. So CAE and OPP directly impact weaning rates due to congested udders and grazing abilities from swollen, painful joints. If you are basing your production uh, module on, uh, you know, that animal grazing, if they don't feel well enough to do it, then why they're not going to. And then uh, due to the, you know, congested udders, you're going to have a reduction in milk production. So that's going to impact the health of those animals. Um, and remember, those kids, they need a belly full of milk, especially if you're uh, lambing or kidding in late winter, early spring. Uh, they need those calories to stay warm. So you could have perfectly fine kids in the evening and then come out and find them dead with no obvious signs of injury. And sometimes that's just due to lack of calories. Uh, Yoni's effects include uh, weight loss, poor performance, and suboptimal feed con conversion due to thickened intestinal walls. Uh, John's is uh, insidious because you can have perfectly fat, shiny animals, and they are just loading your pasture up with that inner environmentally resistant uh, to degradation uh, bacterium. Uh, CL causes loss through condemnation and trimming of infected carcasses, uh, even though we're all very aware of, you know, CL being an abscess disease on the outside, they can also have them internally, and that's an issue. So all of these diseases share a commonality of loss of sales for breeding animals, premature culling of affected animals, and increased labor costs due to management issues. Another aspect that I failed to include is loss of sales. There's a industry move to buying a disease-free herd, you know, having that uh, proof of testing. So you have options. You have a fantastic option in Missouri. State and independent testing laboratories can be used by producers to gain insights into herd health. Uh, do not, please, or and you can verify this, uh, please do not test animals younger than six months of age as the potential for uh, maternal antibody interference is real. Um, and that rule of thumb is from UC Davis. Uh, because of our international company, we do a lot of export testing. And uh, with a recent project to Brazil, that was something that the USDA uh, just came out and said, we're not going to approve anything uh, tested under six months of age. And there is your QR code that will take you to the Missouri Department of Agriculture, Animal Health, Veterinary and Di Diagnostic Laboratories. So this is something that I feel like a lot of producers don't think about, and they really should, because a biosecurity plan can be as complicated or as simplistic as you want it to be. You don't have to, it's like data collection. 
you don't have to overcomplicate it, but some thought put into it before you have a problem would be the best thing to do. Um, are you purchasing animals from herds with the same or greater health status? That means if you're testing your herd, you know, are you going to go to the livestock sale and buy something you have no idea about its background? Um, incorporating a 30-day quarantine plan for incoming animals and separating sick animals from the healthy. So that could just be some cattle panels with a small shelter. Uh, and that way, you know, before you bring animals into your herd, you go ahead and give them some time apart to let any issues manifest or, you know, have been tested. And then also when you have an animal that gets sick, you, you want to leave them in the herd. I mean, that's a great way to get everybody sick. And I know I spoke about CAE and CL and Yonis, but, you know, ORF is no fun. Sore mouth is a terrible disease to try and deal with. A respiratory infection, you don't want that to burn through your whole herd. I mean, one, you know, you could have death. And then also the investment of medications and uh, time to treat them in who can get a small ruminant vet. I mean, that's almost impossible. Uh, mitigating wildlife and animal disease vectors. So I'm going to say this a couple of times. Our climate is changing. And that has been proven by the recent release of the um, planting zones here in the last week by the USDA, showing where we are, the soil temperature is getting warming. It is warmer. So what does that mean? That means you're going to have new vectors of disease and then also invasive plants. So animal disease vectors could be insects. It could be rats. So, you know, keeping your feed locked up, that's going to keep uh, rodents and insects out of it. Um, you know, not allowing birds to roost in your barn, like not encouraging massive amounts of wildfowl to... Uh, to roost there and then poop on your animals because that's a great way to transmit diseases and we need to be thoughtful um, about uh, avian influenza, high path avian influenza uh, that has been uh, recently popped up in Arkansas, I know for sure. Um, and then incorporating a way to disinfect visitors in vehicles. So you need to have a way to control who comes onto your farm and if they do, they need to engage in a in biosecurity, which means uh, dis disinfectant. Um, disinfectants with detergents such as Vercon is uh, it's a great way to uh, ensure that you are disinfecting even with the presence of organic material. So bleach is rendered ineffective by organic material, so manure or dirt. Uh, but uh, dis newer, new generation uh, disinfectants such as Vercon have a detergent in them, and that allows uh, that disinfectant to work more effectively. So we're going to talk about feed efficacy now. I told you we're going to talk about a lot of things. So what is feed efficacy or efficiency? The amount of feed required to increase a market animal's weight by one pound is called the feed conversion e efficiency. So if a market hog is fed three pounds of feed and gains one pound, it has an F CE ratio of three to one. So one, something you should be tracking is how much feed are you feeding your animals? You know, what does it take to keep them in good condition? And then also you should be doing BSEs on your animal, uh, body score evaluations, um, body score conditions, evaluations. And Dr. Brown can uh, go over that with you um, at a later time. But that gives you the ability to really track and monitor your animal's uh, condition, fat deposits. You know, are you feeding too much or too little? Um, you know, having a fat animal can impact reproductive capabilities. And you're wasting money, if we're being honest. Um, if you are able to incorporate regular weighing of your young stock, you can identify the genetics that are more likely to have a greater degree of feed efficiency. Um, so, as we all know, feed is only getting more expensive, and the targeted use is going to, you know, the, the using, using it in the greatest efficient manner, man, manner possible means that you are feeding them exactly what they need to gain the goal that you have in mind for your program. 
Um, another aspect of on-farm data collection that I've really seen have a huge impact for sales is you don't have to go through the data performance programs. If you have clear, concise, and organized data collection on farm, for instance, 30, 60, 90 day birth weight, um, maybe some information on feed conversion, you're going to expand your market of sales. So if I were to go to someone and say, I wanna buy your young stock and they had no on-farm data collection, their animals were untested, it was really just a shot in the dark on what I was going to get from them genetically, I would pass and pay more for someone who did have that data. And it's just something to consider. So I am going to wax poetic about this aspect. Um, all types of operations need to take a holistic approach to nutrition. Uh, this means each nutritional nu input, hay, feed, minerals, and forage, should be measured whenever possible. Examples include soil testing, hay testing. Um, this can be done through your extension office, um, most of the time for free or for low cost. Um, I am from the dairy world, so we, you know, when you approach that massive nutritional need to, to create milk, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to feed them this feed and it's done. So you have to you look have to look at all parts. So the way this way your money is invested is applied wisely to the greatest benefit to the animals and your profit margin. The nutritional value of your feeding plan is the combination of all of the inputs available to the animals. So this is this means if you're feeding if they're on pasture this means your forage. If you're feeding hay this means your hay your feed and your minerals. So what you're going to start with is that base input. If they're on pasture, obviously the soil needs to be tested because anything that your grass is going to contain is going to be directly derived from the soil itself. And if your soil is depleted in selenium or copper or zinc or cobalt, then that plant is not going to have that bioavailable for your animal. If you have a consistent hay supplier, I would suggest, you know, spending 20 bucks every year and making sure that that hay is, is running consistently. Um, and remember, there's more to a soil uh, uh, test, NPK, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potash. Uh, there's all those uh, other minerals involved in the soil. Uh, once you have that data uh, from your forage and your hay, then you incorporate your minerals in your feed to complete that mineral profile along with the fat, the carbohydrates that they're going to need. Holes they have, be it growth or uh, gestation or lactation or just, you know, being a healthy weather standing in your pasture. Okay, so a good rule to go by is maintaining a cumulative balance of a two to one calcium phosphorus ratio. Um, I have read uh, papers that said sheep can go up to a seven to one, but ultimately you want to stay within this two to one uh, balance. This ratio is required for lactating and growing animals and will reduce the incidence of urinary calculi in males. Um, when lactating or gestating, animals need the correct amount and balance of bioavailable calcium. The body will rob from the most available source. This can be dental bone is a problem for all mammals, mammals including humans. Um, and this is true. So without healthy teeth, an animal can lose valuable production cycles and need to be colder than she would otherwise. Uh, without teeth, an animal can't eat. And if an animal can't eat, it can't do what you want it to do. It can't have babies. It can't feed them. It can't grow out. And if you can, if you invest in genetically valuable animals and the difference between, you know, cutting their production lifespan short by three years is, is not providing enough calcium, that is a wasteful approach to your program. Uh, remember that animals have varied nutritional requirements throughout the year. So, you know, 
once again, a gestating animal is going to have a different um, need for minerals, fats, uh, and uh, protein than an animal that is dry and that is just, you know, hanging out basically. Uh, this is some, these are some suggestions for pasture-based programs uh, that I've run across, um, having my own animals and also uh, working with people. And this is from my plant science background. You need to walk your pastures and you need to become confident ident identifying cool and warm season species. So I know that takes time, but it is a solid investment of your time because as the climate changes, we are going to start to see different species of plants start to pop up and not all plants are good for your animals. And being able to identify invasive species, toxic species can stop a problem before it gets started. And we all know that, you know, treating a sick animal is a whole lot harder than spraying Roundup on an invasive plant that is toxic. Um, when a pasture has plenty of water, that's typically not an issue because there's plenty of things for it to grow. I mean, that are growing for the animals to eat that they would prefer. But as a pasture becomes stressed, they're going to be forced to eat things they normally wouldn't. And in that point, and at that point, you know, being able to identify and eradicate species that could be problematic if ingested is just, you're just stopping a problem before it starts. Uh, another um, issue is biodiversity. If you have biodiversity within your pastures, they're more resilient when it comes to uh, drought uh, events and they will bounce back faster uh, and then of course, incorporating rotational grazing with an emphasis of not grazing on forage below four inches. Uh, that The first four inches of forage growth has the most amount of parasite eggs. So as you continue to, to grow, go up the length of the plant above that four inches, you have less and less. And that is why, you know, you see a lot of suggestions to graze at a six inch or five inch height on your pasture. Um, and then also using multi-species grazing to break the life cycle of parasites. So you can um, perhaps graze your sheep or goats first and then graze cattle. And because uh, barber pole does not impact cattle, um, you're, it's going to break that, that. That parasite does not have the ability to, to fulfill its life cycle. And then you have less of a pressure. Uh, so... I'm going to wrap this up with this idea. You cannot man manage what you do not measure. No matter the size or species, the goal of any production operation should be healthy and economically sound animals. On-farm data collection, analysis, and thoughtful application is the foundation of important herd management decisions. So think about it like this. If you don't watch your bank account and you just spend, it's always a stunner whenever you overdraft. So, th and that's not a reasonable way to live your life. Measuring mm. your feed inputs, measuring your animal's condition, be it through weight, through, you know, body scores, uh, body condition scores, through uh, mancha, through FECs, that's going to empower decisions. And there's so much of it that seems like that it's out of our control, but there's so much of it that is. And we just have to approach this as a math problem. You know, you need your inputs to be able to do the equation, to, to find out, you know, where you're lacking or where you're doing really well. And you can't compare what you do to other people because your operation is going to be a little different. For instance, where I'm located in Northeast Arkansas is going to be different than northern Missouri and that's okay we need to embrace those differences and uh, you know capitalize on the domestic demand for this the products that we create um, just uh, just for food for thought um, the United States imports over a billion dollars of sheep and goat meat every year uh, because we do not produce enough for the domestic demand for these products and you know, we as producers have a unique opportunity 
to create climate change sustainable protein that's going that that's that's nutritious, that's lean, that's healthy for our, you know, our the citizens of our country and for our environment. Because uh, sheep and goats are able to create uh, choice graded carcasses on pasture alone. That's been proven by the USDA uh, with proper management. So that's just something to think about, and I really appreciate your patience and allowing me to share my thoughts on this industry, and I absolutely love it. Oh, thank you so much. Can you hear me, um, Kristen? Oh, thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you so much, Kristen, for that presentation. Um, I think you really, you talk a lot of important topics today, you know, on things ranging from genetics uh, to um, um, to feed and to disease management. And I think these are very important in to be able to maximize profits in our operation. All right. So I'm going to just um, quickly um, send the first question across to you. The first question says, are there brilliant implement programs for goat outside dairy goat? Or do we have for dairy goat or for meat goat? Do we have brilliant improvement programs for goats outside of dairy goat? This person wants to know, do we have this program for meat goat specifically? Dr. Brown, Chris, go yes. we, we can hear you, but she can't hear you because she has her speakers off because when she turns her speakers on, all that feedback comes back. Oh, oh, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. All right. Okay. So um, let me take another question um, why she's trying to figure that out. Um, with this, I'm going to answer that. Thank you, Austin, for that. Um, the, the, the other person asked a question, if we have any existing spreadsheet to track and analyze the data, you know, as pointed by Christina. Of course, um, as far as I know, we have spreadsheet, you know, for the, um, for the, for the CARU, you know, and I'm going to um, reach out to my colleague, who actually um, send that out, if they have spreadsheet that's meant for um, sheep and gold. But I believe we can have, a, you know, there should be, an assistance spreadsheet that people can actually use for their um, data collection on the farm. And please, uh, kindly um, get back to me on that so I can tell you where to get that spreadsheet for your data collection. And then my question, the question says, um, I've seen a lot of controversy on toxic, toxic versus non-toxic forage for gold where there's a correct information site or knowledge base, same goes for dewormers for good on those dosage. Where if I can even understand the question, you know, she was talking about um, walking your pasture, you know, because, you know, because of um, a lot of dynamics and things that happen, uh, particularly during the um, the drought session, you know, that we just finished, you know, many of the animals actually died because they were not able to tolerate the, tox the toxic in the plant. So, it's very important for us to be able to um, walk a pasture. You know, sometimes these animals can um, tolerate these, some of the animals, because they have a level of experience and because they have the rodent microbes to be able to degrade these toxic plants, you know, but we still need to walk the, uh, the pasture to be able to um, deal with these toxic issues on our farm. All right. Um, we actually want to apologize today for the glitches we had um, in in um, this presentation. We've got to make sure we work on that and um, we've got to get better as we go on. Um, for your information, we're not going to be, be having any a webinar session in in December because of the holidays. We're going to resume back in January and this session holds every fourth Tuesday of every month. And uh, we're going to um, get back to you and we love you to please continue to register. Christina, can you hear me now? Oh, she's still can. Hello, Christina, can you hear me? All right. Hi, hey. I'm having problems with my audio. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, just a quick just question. A I was able to answer a few of them. So let me just read this to you. If you could please answer that before we shut down today. Do we have, are there any breed improvement program for goats outside the dairy goats? This person wants to know, do we have any breed improvement program for meat goats specifically? Okay. All right. I'm having problems with my audio. Please send me the questions. I'll be, 
happy to, to answer that via email. Right. So we're going to send these questions via emails and um, she'll be able to, to answer that and send back to all the people that joined today. Um, thank you so much. We've tried several apps. We've found an Excel database tracking everything that's been most effective. All right, all right. So we're gonna um, get back to you on some of the questions we're not able to take today and send that as, um, as a message to all the participants. We want to thank you again today for joining us and uh, we hope to see you in January as we continue this monthly webinar session. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Bye.